Okay, so <coughs> keep your finger there in Proverbs chapter number 13, and please turn to Psalm 43. So keep your finger in Proverbs 13, but turn to Psalm 43. Psalm number 43. <coughs> Excuse me. Psalm 43. Psalm number 43. In verse 1, it says, Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. For thou art the God of my strength. Why dost thou cast me off? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? O send at thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me unto thy holy hill and to thy tabernacles. Then will I go unto the altar of God, unto God my exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp will I praise thee, O God, my God. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God. For I shall praise him. Who is the health of my countenance and my God? Okay, so notice here in, um, in Psalm, 30, uh, Psalm 43, look down at verse number, verse number 5. It says, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Notice these words in verse number 2. Why go I mourning? That sounds a bit like depression, doesn't it? Mourning, being disquieted, being cast down. Look at verse number 1. It says, Plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Now, in New Zealand, we live in an ungodly nation. Okay, We actually live in a, you could describe it as a dysfunctional nation. Let me read you part of an article from the New Zealand Herald, which was published on 20th of July, 2017. Okay, 2017. This is, this is the New Zealand Herald. Um, it's from a series called Break the Silence. And this particular one is, is titled, More Kids in Crisis Being Turned Away by Public, um, public Health System. It's written by Olivia Carville. This is what she says. It says here, Max was 10 when he tried to kill himself, and he wants you to know about it. It was the summer of 2014. Max was angry because he'd lost control after being kicked out unfairly from a game of handball at school. And he was upset because in the heat of the moment, he'd hit one of his friends and shoved a girl. <clears throat> Max didn't need hospital treatment after a suicide attempt, but he told his classmates, his teachers, and his parents that he wanted to die. He was sent to a specialist mental health service by his primary school, but was turned down because he wa his case wasn't deemed severe enough. Now, a deep-thinking 13-year-old Max has a message for Prime Minister Bill English. My mum tried really hard to get me help. She rang many places, places that advertise that they're available 24-7, places that advertise that they are there for you if you need them. Nobody was. Nobody believed my mum that I was 10 and had been serious about killing myself, he wrote in a letter to the New Zealand Herald. I worry that the taxes we are paying aren't going to the places they should, and we will continue to see a rise in child suicide because of this. I hope we can get Bill English to listen to us, Max wrote, signing off with a smiley face. Almost 2,000 people like Max were rejected or quickly referred on from specialist mental health services in New Zealand last year. That number, contained in documents released under the Official Information Act, grows each year. So does the wait time, with kids in some parts of the country waiting up to six months for an appointment. The Herald's Break the Silence Youth Suicide Series this week investigates New Zealand's thousands of children in crisis, those threatening to become our next suicide statistics, those threatening to cement our position as the worst in the developed world for teen suicide. The shortage of mental health services for children in New Zealand has been labelled many things during our research over the past few months. A child psychiatrist said it was a chronic and systemic crisis. A principal said it was an absolute nightmare. And a mother who fears her son is either going to kill her or himself said it was a frightening national embarrassment. Asked whether New Zealand was doing, <coughs> excuse me, doing enough to help children struggling with mental health issues, the Minister of Health's Deputy Director of Mental Health, Dr Ian Suse, said... I mean, the obvious answer to that is no. It's appalling. Our suicide rate is appalling. It's something we all, as New Zealanders, need to address. An extra $224 million was pushed towards mental health in this year's budget. Health Minister Jonathan Coleman was not available for an interview this week, but in an email from his press secretary, Col Coleman said he was focused on doing more in this area. That's not enough for Max's mum. The people who work at the ministry spend so much time having meetings and talking about the situation that they're not actually listening to the people who have lived through it, she said. I spent hours on the phone trying to get my son help. I was screaming down the phone and I got no help. You can give your kids a sticky plaster when they cut their leg, 
and you can tell them everything is okay, but from the age of 10, I couldn't fix things for Max. And you and no one at that ministry have any idea what, what that feels like for a mother. Mm. English's press secretary said he was not available to talk about children in crisis or Max's letter this week. And just so, just so you can get an understanding, this is talking about, you know, the, obviously the, the current New Zealand government, the National Party, Bill English, just so we understand, the suicide rate is for right across ages has, hasn't changed, whichever government's been, been in charge, okay? Um, then it says CALMS, so that's um, C-H-M-H-S, stands for Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service. CALMS is run by the Ministry of Health and caters only to the most unwell 3% of the population. It provides specialist assessment, treatment and co consultation for those with the most extreme mental conditions. All other cases, those with mild to moderately severe problems, are looked after at family doctors or community centres. That's how the system is meant to work, at least. Child psychiatrist Dr Aaron Culver, who works for CALMS in Wellington, fears the entire model is flawed. The system is based on the presumption that the rest of the services, those beneath CALMS, are running effectively. It's all based on the belief that the whole system of care is working well, Culver said. And when it's not, the whole system breaks. And as increasing numbers of mentally unwell children are referred to, onto CALMS each year, it becomes harder and harder to access the service. Last year, 32,064 children and teenagers were referred to CALMS. And that's 30, that's, you're talking, I mean, think of that, 32,000. Um, a demand that has climbed by almost 6,000 since 2012, according to data obtained under the Official Information Act. Increasing demand goes hand in hand with increasing rejection. Last year, 1,824 children and teenagers were turned down by CALMS. These rejection rates have climbed by 720 since 2012. Schools and parents say suicidal children cannot even make it through the door unless they've got a set plan to kill themselves. Government officials say this perception is not factually accurate because the Ministry of Health policy says people in crisis need to be seen within 48 hours. Our investigation found an apparent gap between policy and reality. Dozens of parents who contacted the Herald said their mentally unstable children were turned down from CALMS because, <coughs> in the words of one, they weren't suicidal enough. They said they stared towards community parenting courses or were told to use a sticker chart to control their children. My son was saying that he should be dead and that nobody liked him, and they said they couldn't help him because he wasn't bad enough, one mother in Hamilton said. The inference was that he actually needed to attempt suicide to get looked at, her father said. When it comes down to an 11-year-old talking about suicide and running into walls and threatening to kill himself, then enough is enough, said a mother in Auckland. You go to these services that are supposed to help you and think, hang on a minute, you're not even listening to me. It's not just parents. According to one principal, primary schools across New Zealand are at crisis point, screaming out for help. Some particularly desperate principals are considering taking radical action to force the government's hand into providing urgent support because they say the alternative is child suicide. Pat Newman, um, head of some principal association, a uh, collective voice for 150 schools in the north, is contemplating advising all schools in the association to expel all students with severe behavioural issues so the government can deny the problem no longer. He said two primary school students aged 9 and 10 in Whangarei had attempted suicide on school grounds recently and he couldn't get either into calms. That's why we're screaming and yelling, Newman said. I've been in the education sector for 40 years, and it used to be only adults committing suicide. Then it came down to teenagers, and now we've got primary school kids. I spend my days fighting to get help for these children, but it's impossible to get any mental health support. This school alone is not alone with regards to this need. And it's not an education problem, it's a health problem. There are no guidance counsellors based in primary schools in New Zealand, but the Ministry of Social Development funds social workers in schools, and the Ministry of Education funds 800 national, they're called Resource Teachers Learning and Behaviour, or RTLBs, to work with children with behavioural and learning needs in classrooms. While RTLBs deal with difficult children who may refuse to sit at their desk, or throw tantrums, or break school property, Newman said they were not trained to deal with children who pick up a pair of scissors and try and stab themselves, or other kids and teachers. Teachers played a vital role in helping students through emotional distress, said Katrina Casey with the Ministry of Education. But they are educators, not mental health experts. Canterbury Primary Principal's Executive Director, Denise Torrey, who is also Principal of Summerfield um, Takura Wairipo, said, the primary schools in the lower, lower South Island were also totally and absolutely under-resourced in mental health for children. 
She has eight students currently waiting for mental health services and has been told they won't be seen for six months. It's a nightmare. It's an absolute nightmare. We need some help. Our kids need help, she said. I'm battling for these kids. I'm constantly trying to get them in somewhere and I'm really worried about my colleagues. They're exhausted and fighting every day to help their students access services that don't <coughs> exist. We are at saturation frustration point. The cries for help have reached those in power and are being discussed behind closed doors at the top levels of government. The issue around school principals being concerned about the rates of mental health problems within their schools needs to be addressed. It's one of the things we are discussing at the moment, said Suse. I wish we could instantly solve this, but the problem is that it's not going to be instantly solved. Just as the solution to childhood obesity isn't sending bariatric surgeons into primary schools, the way to solve the mental health crisis is not asking psychiatrists and psychologists to man school gates. It's a societal problem. It doesn't just rest with the Ministry of Health. It needs to be solved through wider change, and that, Suse said, could take decades. Some cannot wait that long. Sarah, a mother in Mangere, is afraid her 14-year-old son won't even make it to his 18th birthday. At the age of four, Jamie was chasing her around the house with a cricket bat and outlining elaborate plans to kill himself. I was in shock the first time he said it. I told him he didn't even know what that meant, but he fully knew what it meant. He said, I'm going to die, Sarah said. She read everything to try and help her son, but nothing worked and no one would help. Age eight, he tried to stab his primary school principal. Jamie was referred to CALMS, but like Max, wasn't deemed <clears throat> severe enough to enter the system. Sarah was advised to use a sticker chart to try to control his behaviour. He started damaging property, hurting other children, making up stories about being related to Miley Cyrus, and even falsely accused two teachers and a social worker of assaulting him at school. When Jamie was 12, CALMS told Sarah her son would likely be diagnosed with a personality disorder as an adult, but that there was nothing more they could do for him at this stage. What do they expect me to do? My kid was 12, and he's going to be waiting for years to be diagnosed as an adult. I told them he's having increased suicidal thoughts. I told them I didn't see us getting through his teenage years. I said, please tell me how to help him. Again, she was told to use a sticker chart to monitor his behaviour. You can imagine the frustration. Sarah ended up on <coughs> antidepressants. Her marriage broke down, and Jamie was kicked out of high school. She now has locks on every cupboard in the house so he can't access the knives. She's installed locks on her and her nine-year-old daughter's bedroom doors so they can hide during his tantrums. And these are no normal teenage tantrums. Jamie has cracked walls, ripped out plants, broken concrete fences, tried to set the barbecue on fire and strangled his sister. He's 14 now and he's bigger than me. When he was little I could put him in a bear hug and hold him and try to calm him down. There's, now there's no way I can do that, she said. I've spent nights worrying that he's going to stab me in my sleep. I've spent days worrying if today is the day he follows through on his plans to kill himself. I can't get any help for him. I would be amazed if we make it to his 18, if we make it to 18 without a criminal record or suicide. And I'll just sort of skip some stuff. Um, Culver, who we talked about before, who is in, represents the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatrists, he says it's awful for people having to wait for these services because often while somebody's waiting, their problems are getting worse. And we deal with parents' distress when we do get to see them. He says New Zealand now faces a chronic and systemic lack of services for children, and there's no quick fix. One last case, it says there, um, Kaurau Kingi was a kid who couldn't get help. Now 26, he started having problems age 7. He was naughty because no one knew what was wrong, he was called naughty because no one knew what was wrong with him. A private psychologist diagnosed Kingi with ADHD, ADD and Asperger's. But he was never referred into a strained public mental health system because he was never deemed bad enough. Not when he was expelled from primary school for stealing the deputy principal's laptop. Not when he was expelled from high school for hacking the computer system to pull exam results. His parents couldn't afford to pay the private psychologist fees, so Kingy was left to his own devices. Age 14, he started self-harming. Age 15, he attempted suicide. Age 16, he fled New Zealand and moved to Britain on his own. I feel like the system in New Zealand never really helped me. He said, I couldn't connect with anybody because nobody took me seriously. If Max, Jamie and Kaurau can't access harms, who can? The parents of children with additional needs collective carried out a survey of 100 parents who have struggled with these services and found at least half felt their child was at risk of suicide. They shared strikingly similar tales of woe. I was dismissed and told to do a parenting course. They gave me a brochure and said, go to a parenting class. Denied us help. Many of these parents have quit work to stay home and care for their kids because they say the schools and the system just doesn't know how to. 
Tracy Roundtree is one of those parents. Her son was six when he first said he wanted to die. I was beside myself. I didn't know what to do. I had a six-year-old boy saying he wanted to die, <coughs> and we couldn't get access to these services. Aged eight, he was stood down from primary school for throwing things at other children. He was referred to CALMS three times, once by a paediatrician and twice by a Ministry of Education psychologist. We were desperate for help. I was tearing my hair out to get him into CALMS, and when we finally got into the system and he was seen, I was just told to go to a parenting course. When Max's mother exhausted all other options to get her son into the public system, she too turned to a private psychologist, even though she couldn't afford it. Appointments can cost about $400. After speaking with Max for an hour on his first visit, the private psychologist said he didn't want to charge, saying instead there should be something in place for these children. He suggested she exaggerate the truth to get Max into calms. You need to tell him that he's cutting himself. That's the way to get him in. Last June, Max was rejected from CALMS again and sent back to his GP for help. In his letter to the Herald, Max said he'd been referred to specialist mental health services seven times and they continued to reject me. I worry that other kids are going through what I went through and still go through. I worry that their parents are as upset as my parents are at the lack of help. I agree to speak to you and put my story out there to try and help these other kids who wrote. The Herald was provided Max's last rejection letter from CALMS. It simply said, Max does not require secondary mental health services. We will now close Max's file. The article finishes with, you know, the usual, some names have been changed to protect the identity of the children in the story. If you're worried about your or someone else's mental health, the best place to get help is your GP or local mental health provider. Okay, so that was quite big, but just to let you... To, I wanted to give you a picture of, that's what, things, that's what people in New Zealand are thinking at the minute. Okay, and the reasons why they think that, I mean according to an OECD, an OECD report, New Zealand has the highest rate of teen suicide in the developed world. Youth Deline Director Stephen Bell says in a normal week, two teenagers or two children kill themselves. Estimated about 20 young people will be hospitalised for self-harm each week. Now, it's pretty obvious from this, we are living in a dysfunctional society. We're living in an ungodly society. Well, so was the psalmist. That's what we read about in Psalm 43. The psalmist was living in an ungodly society, and he was a bit down about it. You could say he was suffering from depression. And what we're actually looking at tonight is those topics of dysfunction, depression, and ultimately where it leads to, which is death. That's the title of the sermon tonight. Dysfunction, depression, and death. Now, just a disclaimer. There are many different causes of dysfunction and depression. Okay? There is not a single solution to a complex set of problems, just so you understand. But having said that, the Word of God has a lot of light that can be shed on some of these problems that leave the experts throwing up their hands and saying we've got a chronic systemic crisis no one can solve. Now, am I saying that we can fix the problem in New Zealand? I'm not saying that, okay? But I do believe that there are solutions that we, because honestly, New Zealand's not going to change. It's not, just so you understand. But there are solutions that we can put into place in our lives and in our own families which can make a huge difference. Okay, turn back to um, Proverbs chapter number 30, uh, 13. Sorry, Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs chapter 13, where we started. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse number 13. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 13 says, Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. The law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Good understanding giveth favour, but the way of transgressors is hard. So notice what it says here. Firstly, it says despising the word. What does that lead to? That leads to destruction. Despising what God says leads to destruction. Then it says the law of the wise, what is it? It's a fountain of life. It's something that, you know, that will... Um, it's a, it's a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. So this is saying that God's word and God's wisdom can lead to life as opposed to death. And when th the fact is, in our country around us today, there's a lot of death going on. There are these suicides that are happening much more than they've ever happened before. Like people, There's always been people who have committed suicides. But there hasn't always been teenagers who committed suicides. And there certainly hasn't always been primary school children who've committed suicide. Okay, and then notice then what it says in that in that last one, verse number fifteen. Mm. It says, "Good understanding giveth favour, mm. but the way of transgressors are hard." The transgressors, people who transgress God's law, that leads to difficulty. That leads to a hard life. 
When you break God's law, there are bad things that will happen. Turn back to Proverbs chapter number 4. Proverbs chapter number 4. Proverbs chapter number 4. Proverbs chapter number 4, verse number, <coughs> verse number 1. See what it says here. This is some of God's instructions. It says, Hear ye children the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also, and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words. What does it say? Keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Look down at verse number 10. Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many. I have taught thee in the way of wisdom, I have led thee in right paths. When thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened, and when thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. Take fast hold of instruction, let her not go, keep her, for she is thy life. Look down at verse number 20. Verse number 20. My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. So notice over and over, listening to God's word, hearkening to the instructions is associated with what? Life. As opposed to the ways of death. And then it says, um, let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Isn't that saying that attending to God's word can lead to life and it can lead to health? Now, the article that, I, that we read, it was talking about mental health problems, which result in what? They result in death. You see, God wants us to experience health. Now, I'm not saying that we're going to be happy or joyful all the time. There are things which happen in people's lives which cause them to feel down, cause them to feel sad or troubled. You know, maybe it's an illness they have. Maybe it's bereavement. You know, maybe it's even a physical thing like an earthquake happening. You know, when something like that, that happens, it disturbs people. Okay? Um, maybe family breakup. You know, these are all things that happen. And also, when people need to understand, it's actually normal to feel up one day and down another day. That is normal. In fact, it's normal to feel up and down in the same day. That is it. In fact, if ever you feel really up and you're feeling really great, just rest assured, it won't be long before you'll be feeling down again. That's just part of being a human. Okay? That's normal. But when young people are feeling so down they try to harm themselves or even kill themselves, everyone knows that there is something seriously wrong. It's not a healthy situation we find ourselves in. Mental health issues are afflicting young people in greater numbers than ever before today. Okay? But God, he wants us to be in health. It says in 3 John 1, 3 John 1 verse 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prosper. God wants us to be healthy, and that includes mental health. Okay? God doesn't want people to be un, you know, mentally unhealthy. Isaiah chapter 58 verse 8 says, Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. And so what we're saying here, he says, look, he's saying thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. Health, notice, is associated with what? Righteousness. Health is associated with righteousness. Interesting, we saw all the life before was associated with t paying heed to God's word, paying attention to what he says. Proverbs chapter number 16 verse 24 says, Pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and health to the bones. You see, the words that we find in the Bible, they are pleasant words. We sang um, Psalm 119 before, Psalm 119 verse 103. Remember, it, we sang about how sweet are thy words unto thy taste, unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter number 22. Proverbs chapter number 22. Excuse me. Proverbs chapter number 22. Proverbs 22, verse number 17. Proverbs 22, verse 17 says, Bow down mine ear, and hear the words of the wise, and apply thine heart unto my knowledge, for it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee. They shall with all be fitted in thy lips, that thy trust may be in the Lord. I have made known to thee this day, even to thee. Have not I written to thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge, that I may make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. Okay, so God's word, God's word, it is a pleasant thing. God's word is sweet to our taste, and God's word is truth. 
Proverbs 4.21 says, Let them not depart from thine eyes, we saw it before. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for thy life unto those who find them in health to all their flesh. So God's word is promising that it will actually bring us life and health. Well, that, that sounds like just the solution to you know, the, the dysfunction, the depression, and the death that we read about earlier. Well, you might ask, how is it that God's word can bring life and health? I'm going to talk about just quickly five ways that God's word can bring health this evening. Five ways that it can bring health. And um, when, we, when we look at these, you'll find that these things that God's word says, that it's different than what New Zealand health system is talking about. It's different from what the government's talking about. It's different from the schools are talking about. But what they're doing, it's not working. It's clearly not working. Okay. In fact, what I'm, what I'm about to read to you from God's Word, this is something that not only do they, they don't follow this, they say that this is, this is wrong. That doing this will actually damage children and cause huge problems with children. And yet, the children that are, are under their charge are the ones that are killing themselves. So maybe, or not maybe, I don't really think they know what they're talking about. You're there in Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22, look at verse number 15. Proverbs chapter 22, verse number 15. It says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. See, the very first thing, the way God's word can help, the very first way is that it can, it, what God tells us to do is that we should correct wayward children. When children are wayward, they need to be corrected. Now, I will mention a wee bit later, but you probably noticed when I was reading through that thing. Didn't you notice what these children were doing? Mm. Little children, what were they doing? They were going crazy, and the parents, or often just one parent, had no way of, what can I do, what can I do, until, you, until the kid grew up a bit, and the parent was scared of the child. Is there something wrong with that picture? There's something very wrong with that picture, okay? It says here, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Doesn't that suggest that if you don't use the rod of correction, the foolishness is not going to depart? It's still going to be in the heart of the child. And the child will just get bigger, older, stronger, but still just as foolish, okay? And the thing is, living a foolish life, it results in pain. It results in, in suffering. It results in heartache. It says in Proverbs 9.6, it says, Forsake the foolish and live and go in the way of understanding. Turn to Proverbs 13, Proverbs 13, verse number 23. Proverbs 13 and verse number 23. Proverbs 13 and verse number 23 says, Proverbs 13, um, Proverbs 13, verse 24, excuse me. Proverbs 13, verse 24, it says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteth him betimes. It's saying the person who doesn't spank their child doesn't love their child. But the person who does love them is going to chasten them betimes. He's going to chase them. He's going to discipline them. And that word betimes means early. You see, the time to spank children is when they're young. Okay? That's when children should be spanked, is when they're young. And as they get older, they shouldn't need spanking. Because why? The foolishness has to part. Now, we're all, we all still have foolishness. We're all still sinners. No one's, no one's going to be perfect. But the fact is, we can learn to behave and not carry on in a crazy fashion that we read about here. Okay, um, Have a look at Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23, verse number 13. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse number 13. Proverbs chapter 23, verse number 13. Says, Withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Notice what it's saying here. He's saying, look, he says, don't withhold correction. He says, you've beat him with the, with the rod. He's not going to die. Now, when the Bible's talking about this, you see, the rod is to be used. And I'm, gonna, I was, I'm sort of getting ahead because there's some other things later on. I'll mention later, but you read studies. You see, there are studies out there, scientific studies, published by universities, you know, these researchers. And do you know what they say, these studies? They say that spanking doesn't work. That's what they say. They say that spanking does not work. That when you spank children, it makes them violent, it makes them aggressive, it makes them badly behaved. I don't think these children we read about were being spanked. They had sticker charts, they had parents that were scared from, scared of them. So, that doesn't quite add up. But not only that, I mean, all the people that I know that raise their children in a biblical manner, using loving correction as the Bible describes, not doing it because you're angry, 
Not shouting and screaming at the kid, not losing control, but when the child needs correction, correcting the child, using a wooden spoon sometimes. You know, the, God, the Bible talks about using an implement rather than having a child who's scared of your hand. Okay, that's what the Bible talks about. The people that I know that do that, do you know what? Their children are nice. They're pleasant. They're a delight to be around. Okay? Now, but what they do in these studies, just, to, just so you know, because I've read a number of these studies, and what they do is they take people who use normal, you know, reasonable spanking on their children, and they join those in with people who abuse their children. People who lose their rag, a kid makes a mistake, they, they, they drop a dish on the ground and break it by accident, and the parent loses their rag and whacks them and beat, does all sorts of stuff. Now look, if you, if you, now, if you beat a child, not in what the Bible's talking about with beating, which is a spanking applied to the backside, if you beat a child, if you punch your child, if you kick your child, if you physically assault your child, if you abuse your child, guess what? That is going to make them violent. Okay? That is going to cause bad things in their life. Okay? You know, the children of gang members, guess what? <laughs> they become violent because they're treated badly. But what happens in these studies is they lump together people who do decent things with people who are doing wicked atrocities, and then lo and behold, what's happening to the people that do that? They say, oh look, it shows that, you know, it produces bad things. But all it is, it's just what they've done with the studies. That's what they've done with the studies. Because the people who do the studies, they think that spanking is bad. So they're trying to find the results that they want. <laughs> That's why they do it. Okay? So... But the Bible, the Bible says something different. And, and people say, oh, well, that's just in the Old Testament. That's just the Old... No, it's not. In the New Testament, we see the same thing. Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter number 12. Uh, look at verse number 9. We've been here before, but Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 9 says, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our own profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So this is describing it. And if we look back in... in, in um, uh, I mean, look, verse number six. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And so what we're saying is, God's saying, he spanks his children. And if you love your children, you will spank your children. That is the best thing for them. That, because it's going to correct them. You see, you can't reason with a two-year-old. Two-year-olds, you cannot reason with them. They lack the ability to reason. You can't reason with them. And so... What's the point of trying to reason with a two-year-old? But you can correct them, biblically, and the Bible says, chasten them betimes. That means early. Do it early. Okay? And notice what it said here. It's for our profit. So God spanks us for our profit. The reason we should spank our children is for their profit. It's for their good. Okay? And it's going to yield the peaceable fruit of unrighteousness. Well, I mean, let's compare that. Compare it to what we read here. What do we read here? What did to say? Let's look at the one... Um, uh, which was one, Jamie, I think it was. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, how does this compare this? Sarah, a mother in Mangaree, is afraid her 14-year-old son won't even make his 18th birthday. At the age of four, Jamie was chasing her around the house with a cricket bat. Well, can you not see a problem with that? A four-year-old chasing his mother around the house with a cricket bat. Do you think you could stop that problem pretty quickly? I bet I could stop it really quickly. It would be very simple to stop. Okay? And he, but, and, but so look, he's chasing around, and then he's, and then he's also saying he's got these elaborate plans to kill himself. Why? Because the thing is, children actually desire boundaries. And if you don't give them boundaries, they actually go off the rails. They need boundaries. Now, there should be loving boundaries. They should be consistent boundaries. But they need boundaries. Okay? Here she said, I was in shock the first time he said it. Blah, blah, blah. Um, she tried everything. Um, age 8 he threatened to stab his primary school principal of course because remember now the, play, the best place for discipline is at home that's where it should be done but in the old days it used to be at school now not that I agree with schools I don't agree with sending people off to school you're better off to teach your children as the Bible describes but if you're going to do that they send them off to schools and now the schools have no power to do anything now is it the case that there's ever been schools where they've abused their power and done things they should not have? absolutely but at the same time where you've now got at a school where kids are just out of control. 
what, 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 do, what can they do? They can, they can call the police if a child gets out of control. I mean, how ridiculous is that? And this is for, for primary school as well. Okay? Um, and what does it say here? He started damaging property, hurting other children, you know, all these different things he was doing. And then it gets to the stage where, um, yeah, she now has locks on every cupboard in the house so he can't access the knives. She's installed locks on her and her nine-year-old daughter's bedroom doors so they can hide during his tantrums. So her and her daughter are locked in their bedrooms while he's going crazy. Okay? And so, you know, he's 14 now and he's bigger than me. When he was little, I could put him in a bear hug and hold him and try and calm him down. Well, who told you that when he was little, the way to calm him down is to put him in a bear hug? I've never put any of my children in a bear hug to calm them down, ever. You know, maybe having a play fight might have a bear hug, but not to calm them down for being naughty. There's a different solution that works, and, and being in a bear hug doesn't work. Okay? Um, and now she says, now there's no way I can do it. I've spent nights worrying that he's going to try and stab, he's going to stab me in my sleep. I've spent days worrying that to, if today is the day he's going to follow through and he's going to kill himself. You see, and, and it's just crazy. When you compare it to what God says, what we should be doing is correcting our children. So that's the first one, and, and that should be pretty obvious. That should be pretty obvious. The second thing that's going to help you, this is the second thing that's going to help us using God's solution as opposed to the world's solution. The second thing is actually being righteous. Being righteous. This is because what we're talking about, what's going to help a kid not want to kill themselves? One of them is if you correct them, if you spank them, stop them doing wrong, you're going to correct them, that's going to help them. But the second thing is for them to be righteous. And these are actually related to each other. Because if you spank them and correct them, it's going to help them to be righteous, to do what the right thing is. You see, it says in, because um, when someone kills themselves, do you think they're happy or do you think they're sad? Do you think they've got joy or do you think they don't have joy? They don't have joy, do they? Well, have a look and see what it says in 1 John. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1 verse 4. 1 John chapter 1 verse 4 says, And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. So John's writing this so that people would be joyful. What does he say in verse 1 of chapter 2 though? My little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. Is he writing it so that people wouldn't sin or so they'd be joyful? He's doing both because when you don't sin, it's going to make you happy. Because when you sin, it's going to make you sad because it produces bad things. And everyone knows. You know, it's, the thing is, and we could list lots of different things, where the Bible lists things that we should do and things we shouldn't do. The Bible says we should work hard. We should work hard. And guess what? When people don't work hard, are they happy or are they sad? They're sad. People who work hard are happy. Okay? There's nothing like working hard. You go to bed at night and you have a feeling... Who's ever had a day where you've, where you've been slack and you've been lazy and you've done nothing and you go to bed at night and you just feel bad, don't you? Because you know what you should have done. What about when you've had a day when you've worked hard? Maybe you've done physical hard, maybe you've been studying hard, you've had stuff to do and you've done it. And you go to bed and you put your hair on the pillow and it's like, you feel good. Because you did what you should have done. Okay? That's called being righteous, it's doing the right thing. Being productive, you know, serving others, helping other people. You know, people who help other people, who serve other people, they feel good about themselves. But people who don't, who's just thought, you just serve me, they don't feel good about themselves, okay? So, being righteous, that's something else, you know? It says in Ecclesiastes 8.13, it says, But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not God. So the wicked person who doesn't fear God, he's not going to prolong his days. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 27 says, The fear of the Lord prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. When people are wicked, their years get shortened. And you can look at lots of examples of that. You can look at some of these wicked um, rock stars and the wicked lives of sin they live. And how long do they live? Their lives get cut short. Some of these rappers. Okay, now, I, I mean, I was in a generation that was beyond me, so I, I'm not familiar. I mean, I'm familiar with the music that was popular when I was a kid. But rap came after my time, you know, so it's not like I've never, I've never thought rap, you know. But it's, it's, it's wicked, these people, and they promote every sort of violence and, and perversion and just... And yet if you read about them, how many of these rap stars have died in their 20s? Countless of them, you know? And so that, the Bible says, you know, the wicked... In fact, there's something like, the wicked shall not live out half their days, the Bible says. So children need to be corrected. Also, following on from that is being righteous, doing the right thing. The third thing is, this is something else that the Bible is going to promote. The Bible promotes 
correcting children, being righteous, and it also promotes keeping fathers and mothers together. Okay? I mean, for starters, it actually provide, it pro promotes the idea of men and women being married. Not just living together, not just sleeping together, but actually being married. That's what it says, being married in the first place. You see, God, he hates divorce. Look at Malachi chapter number 2. Malachi chapter number 2. If you go to the very first book in the, in the New Testament is Matthew, and you just turn back to the last book in the Old Testament is Malachi. Malachi chapter number 2. Malachi chapter number 2 and verse number 14. It says, Yet you say, Wherefore, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou dealt treacherously, Yet she is thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. He's saying, look, this is your wife who you made a covenant with. You made an agreement with her. It says, verse 15, And did he not make one? Yet he had the residue of the Spirit. And wherefore one? So why did he make the two? He's talking about, why did the two people become one? Why is it that God wanted to join these two together? That he might seek a godly seed. God wanted godly offspring. That's why man and woman are supposed to come together. Therefore take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. Verse 16, For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. He's saying he hates it when a husband puts away his wife or a wife puts away a husband. God hates divorce. He says he hates it. For one covereth violence with his garments, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. Because it's treacherous to make a promise to someone. Say, I'm going to be with you forever. And then you go off with someone else. You go and leave. That's being treacherous, you know. And the thing is, when that happens, um, it leads to bad results for the children. Okay, it leads to bad results for the children. Jesus said the same thing in, in Matthew chapter, you're there in Malachi, just never look at Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 31. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 31. Matthew 5 verse 31, it says, It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Right there he says, look, the only cause, fornication, any, if you divorce you, oh, we don't get on, I'm going to divorce you. Well, he says, if you do that, and you get married again, you are committing adultery. You're causing your wife to commit adultery because you're still married. Because it's not a legitimate, it wasn't a legitimate divorce according to that. Okay? And so, actually have a look at, um, have a look at Proverbs. Look at Proverbs. And notice, because God's word gives wisdom, remember? God's word gives wisdom. And that's the thing that's going to that's gonna solve the problem. Have a look how often it talks about fathers and mothers in the book of Proverbs. Look at Proverbs chapter number 1, verse number 8. Proverbs 1, 8 says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Proverbs 4, 3. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. Um, Proverbs chapter 6, and verse number 20. It says, My son, keep thy father's commandment, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Proverbs chapter 10, verse number 1. Um, the Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. Notice here you can see there's a family unit here. There's a family unit. Now understand, I'm not, you know, some people, it's not that some people will be in a situation where they're not in a normal family unit. You know, their mother and father split up. They were just with their mother, or just with their father. Maybe they're different people altogether. That's not their fault. Okay? But we're looking at saying, what does God want? What is what does He desires the best? And also, you might be in a situation like that. That doesn't mean that you can't t turn out to okay. Okay, it's not saying that because I'm from a broken home, therefore my life's going to be wrecked and ruined. But the fact is, being from a broken home increases the chances, and we'll see that in a minute, of, of bad results happening. Um, you're there in Proverbs 10. Have a look at Proverbs chapter 15, verse 20. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse number 20 says, "A wise son maketh a glad father." But a foolish son despiseth his mother. Right, have a look at um, Proverbs chapter 19, verse 26. Proverbs 19, verse 26. He that wasteth his father and chases away his mother is a son that causeth shame and bringeth reproach. That sounds a bit like the one that we saw. Sounds like someone was chasing their mother there. Um, have a look at Proverbs chapter number 23. Proverbs chapter number 23 and verse number 22. It says, Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. Verse number 25, Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. And what they're talking about, actually look back at verse 24, The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth the wise child shall have joy of him. So when you, make, when you do right things, it's going to make your parents happy. It's going to give, you'll have joy, and they'll have joy as well. 
Look at chapter 30. Look at Proverbs chapter number 30. Proverbs chapter 30, verse number 11. It says, There is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. There is a generation, sounds like this generation now. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. Look at verse number 17. The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother. Does that sound like some of these kids? The ravens of the valley shall pick it out and the young eagles shall eat it. What's it saying? When people are going to do these things, there's going to be bad results. That's what's going to ha happen. And as I said, I'm not, I'm not getting at you if you weren't raised by two parents. Okay? You can still turn out fine without being in the best circumstances. And likewise, you could have been read in the best circumstances and you can choose to go off and destroy your life. Okay? But the ideal situation is to be raised by both a father and a mother. You know, did you notice in the, in the Herald article how often it seemed to, it didn't it sound as though there was no father on the scene? Some of them there was, some of them was a divorce that went through. But they didn't all sound like there was fathers and mothers. It sounded like solo parenting was going on in some of those um, situations there. Um, and so, yeah, it's important that we, under, that we understand these things, you know. Um, actually, listen to, listen, to, um, listen to some of these quotes from, this is a publication about fathers being absent, okay? This is, a, this is talking about fathers being absent. Have a listen to some of these. these, are, these this, is, this is some research that's been done and, and things that they've found out when there's no dad on the scene. Okay, things that can happen. Children may feel unprotected. There is an increased risk of abuse from new partners, strangers, and the mother. Boys have more trouble with the police and anti the police, law, and antisocial behaviour. Ninety percent of West Auckland police-involved youth are fatherless. Ninety percent of the youth in West Auckland that the police are dealing with, there's no father on the scene. Okay, boys are more inclined to suicide and have poor mental health. Fatherless males are five times more likely to commit suicide. 63% of New Zealand youth suicides are from fatherless homes. Two-thirds of the suicides, there's no dad there. Two-thirds of them. Um, boys may lack the clear and more black and white boundaries that males tend to hold. Under fathered or you know, absent fathered men, they're more likely to be violent to their partners. Um, Fatherless boys are 10 times more likely to abuse chemicals. 10 times more likely. Truancy may increase. Fatherless boys are 71% of high school dropouts. 71% of the people who drop out from high school, no dad. Okay? Nine times, oh actually that was in the US, in New Zealand it was nine times more likely to drop out of high school. Um, fatherless boys are 20 times more likely to end up in prison. 20 times more likely. Poverty is more common in fatherless homes. Because some people often say, oh, these bad situations, it's all because of poverty. But poverty comes about. You know, poverty is in more, single parent families are three times more likely to experience poverty than a two parent home. 90% mm -hmm. um, of all homeless and runaway children come from fatherless homes. The children that run away, 90% of them are from fatherless homes. Okay? So, what, what God's solution, correct the children. Be righteous. It's going to train them to be righteous. Keep fathers and mothers together. You know, be right. I mean, the thing is our government promotes the opposite of that. Don't they? They'll give you the DPB. They'll support you. You split. They'll, they'll, you know, I mean, they're, they're not in favour of it at all. They're not promoting things. And it's not, it's not just this government. All the governments. It's, it's the same. Okay? But the fourth thing God's word can do that can help prevent this tragedy, which is a tragedy, what's going on, that can do giving people hope. You see, a major reason why someone would try and end their life is because they think they've got no hope. There is no hope. It says in Proverbs 13, 12, it says, Hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Have a look at 2 Thessalonians. Turn to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 and verse number 16. 2 Thessalonians 2. In verse 16, it says, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself 
And God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us an everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Okay, so notice what he says. It says, he's loved us, he's given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Faith in God, it gives you hope. And what does that do? It comforts your heart. It comforts your heart. Have a look in, um, you're in 2 Thessalonians. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 8. It says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. You see, the hope of salvation, that's something that will, it's a helmet. What does a helmet do? It protects your mind. It protects, protects your, your, you know, your thought processes. It's protected by that. Have a look back at chapter number 4. Chapter number 4 of um, 1 Thessalonians, verse 13. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. And obviously this is talking about the difference between when someone dies, um, you know, uh, you've got you know, a believer and a believer dies, and, and we know we're going to see them again, versus someone, an unbeliever dies. You know, and, 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 what, and, and unbelievers, what are they, they don't have any hope. And so they sorrow. But, we don't, and so, but you see, is when you've got hope, that changes the sorrow, doesn't it? It changes the sorrow. Okay, um, and Romans 12.12 12 talks about rejoicing in hope. When we have hope, we rejoice. And guess what? When we rejoice, we're not about to kill ourselves. Okay, so we need to use God's method of discipline. We need to encourage young people to be righteous. We, we need to keep fathers and mothers, keep families together. We need to give people hope. You want to stop someone from committing suicide? Preach them the gospel. Give them the hope that's found in Jesus Christ. And then the last one that we'll look at, the last one just quickly, is avoiding drugs. Avoiding drugs. You see, there are many warnings in the Bible about the importance of being sober. Okay, Proverbs chapter 20 and verse number 1. Proverbs 20 verse 1 says, Wine is a mock, a strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Proverbs chapter 23 Verse 29 says, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red. God says, don't even look at it. When it giveth this colour in the cup, when it moveth itself aright, at the last it biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange woman, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, there shall be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, I felt it not. When shall I wait? I will seek it yet again. Speaking of the, addicting, uh, the addiction that comes with alcohol. Now, is alcohol a big factor in these problems among young people? To be honest, I, I don't think it probably is. Not in you know, primary school kids. and you know, I don't think it's really a problem unless problems caused in the home because of alcohol with the parents. Yep, I would say. But you see, there are other drugs. There are other drugs other than alcohol. That are, in fact, young people today, and this is, this is quite bizarre when you think about it, young people today are routinely prescribed mind-altering drugs. They're given because of their behaviour, because they're not giving a spanking to correct them. We won't spank you. We will give you narcotics. We'll give you drugs that if you were to sell these drugs on the street, you'd be put in prison. But you go to your doctor, he'll write your prescription and give you one. He'll tell you you've got a chemical imbalance in your, in your brain, and that's why we need to give you these drugs, without doing any tests. Why is it without doing any tests? Because there are no tests. Read up about it. Read up, read up about ADHD. Read up about, you know, read up about bipolar. Read up about these things. What tests are there? What chemical tests are there? There are none. There are absolutely none. And what they're doing with these drugs, they're prescribing them to children. They used to just prescribe them to adults. And they, but guess what? They didn't work with adults either. But now they prescribe them to children. You know? They let children, they run wild without biblical discipline. They're out of control. They say, let's drug them instead. You've got depression. You need, okay, we'll give you some drugs. You're, not, you're feeling down? We'll give you some drugs. And they, they, you could have a legitimate reason for feeling down. You might have experienced, you know, people lose their job or, you know, someone's, there's a death in the family. Someone dies. It's natural to feel depressed. It's okay to feel depressed. It's normal to feel depressed. But, oh no, you, you feel depressed, so we'll give you some drugs. And yet these drugs, what well, these drugs have side effects. What are the side effects? 
depression, suicidal thoughts, mania. I mean, you name it. That's that's what they have, and they give them that. You know. I mean, the, the, here's the um. There's another one here. I've got these are the suicide statistics from the New Zealand Suicide Trends book. But this was published by the Ministry of Health. Okay. And according to this, and this goes right back to 1923. According to this, the number of um, people who committed suicide in age 5 through 14 years, that the youngest sort of age bracket that I've got here. Prior to 1986, there was no one. None. At all. None at all. Okay, 1986 is when it first started occurring. And, and this chart I've got only goes up to 2003, but you've got a bunch of them there in the 90s. But then what was that guy saying? That um, guy that we read about at the start, he was saying that let me just check the numbers here. He said, um, youth director Stephen Bell says in a normal week, two teenagers or two children kill themselves. That's per week, in a normal week. 20 young people will be hospitalised for self-harm each week. But prior to 1986, it wasn't happening. And now it's happening, and it's increasing. And that other chart also shows, it shows the next age group up. It shows 15 through 24. And around about the 80s, in fact it is, if you look in the early 80s, in fact, around that same time, it practically doubled and then increased beyond there, the number of them. So there were people killing themselves in that lower age group, but it doubled then. It shot up. And it's still high today. Okay? And so, what we need to understand is that, you know, before 1986, people in that age group, they weren't killing themselves, and now they are. You know, people in that 15 to 24 age group, they're killing themselves a lot more. What has changed? Now, as I said, Remember the, remember the disclaimer I did at the start to say that there's, you know, there's many different causes of dysfunction and depression. There's not a single solution. Okay? But God's word sheds light on it. That can bring hope. It can bring change in people's lives. And when we look at these things, there are other things. You know, I mean, when I first started reading this article in the Herald, at the start, before I even went through to, to keep reading, I thought to myself, what could cause that? Why could it? Because the Rex were saying this, there's these people, they, they're killing themselves. Young people, teenagers, primary school children. What has changed? And I thought, well, what could have changed? Let me think, what are the things that, that I can think of? Well, there's the whole, you know, anti-smacking, okay? And obviously, there was a place where it was brought in in New Zealand as, as in law, but long before that, it was brought in as, well, it's bad and you shouldn't do it. I think I was in, I started high school in 1984, and I think it was gone from high school by the time I arrived at high school. It was there still at intermediate, so it must have been in the early 80s was when, you know, caning and the strap and all that sort of stuff disappeared from high schools. So I imagine that's the case. I was just in a normal public school. Mm. So, so that's something that's happened. Mm. Prescribing things like, you know, these mind-altering drugs, that's been going on for about 30 years or so to, to young people, okay? Because other things that popped into my mind, I thought about, you know, you know cell phones, you know, cell phones, the social media, cyberbullying, these sorts of things. Those are definitely factors, absolutely. But they weren't around in the 80s, were they? They weren't. They weren't around in the 80s and the 90s, those things. Okay, so there has to be something there. And as I say, it's called, there's all sorts of complex factors. But those two things, to me, they seem to make the most sense. The lack of discipline that's going on, the lack of spanking, and also drugging children. And we see it increasing. No, I mean, if you've got a better idea, hey, you know, tell me if you've got a better idea. But to me, that makes perfect sense. You know, that makes perfect sense. And I, as I thought that, I thought, I bet it's that. And then I started reading through, and then I read the account of the four-year-old chasing the mother around the house with a cricket bat. I said, yeah, I think if the kid had been spanked and disciplined properly, then I don't think he would have wanted to kill himself when he was 10. I don't think so. Okay? And I wouldn't mind betting that most of these people in here that we read about, that they've also been given, you know, psych anti-psychotic. They've been given mind-altering drugs, is what they've been given. Okay? And um, just so you understand, I'm not against you if you're taking medication. I'm not against you if you're taking mind-altering drugs. Now, do I think it's the right thing? No, I don't. But I, I'm not saying if you're taking, if you're taking medication, mind-altering medication, I'm not saying to stop it, because I've read up on some of these things, and if you stop, you get, I mean, it's, you get really bad effects as well. Because it's something you shouldn't have really done in the first place. And so you kind of, it's, there, and there are ways that people can get off it. But I, I'm not saying, oh, well, that's, I'm just going to throw my medication away. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that at all. 
But what I'm saying is what has happened. And if you're in that situation, you're a victim. It's not your fault. You know, these people who have been giving this stuff out, it's not the people's fault who are taking the medication in any way, shape or form. In the same way, it's not the child, that little child's fault. It's not his fault that he wasn't spanked, is it? It's not his fault. <coughs> okay, so <coughs> the title of the sermon is Dysfunction, Depression and Death. Dysfunction, Depression and Death. You see, there's a way that these problems can be fixed. It says in Proverbs 22.4, it says, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honour and life. By humility, the fear of the Lord, what? It's going to lead to these things. It's going to lead to life. But if you turn it around, put it the other way around, by pride. See, pride could be saying, God doesn't know what he's talking about. We've got a better idea. You know, and there's a, there's a verse in Proverbs that talks about um, removing the, the ancient landmarks. It says, removing the landmarks which our fathers have set. You see, when you take something that people have... You see, there's a lot of wisdom that, that parents have and that grandparents have, which has been passed down from generation to generation. And you'll find a lot of it that comes from the Bible. And one of them is <laughs> spanking your children. But for someone to say, I think my parents and my grandparents and my great-grandparents, in fact, everyone throughout history that we know of going back, they had it all wrong. And we're just going to change it and say, no, we won't do that. And then you see the results. And it's crazy. And yet they're still, because of their pride, no, no, there's some, there's some other cause. It's something else. You know, there's something, there's something in the water. Well, actually, there probably is something in the water, but never mind about that. Okay, so, as I said, and they come out with these scientific studies, these scientific studies to, to show that spanking doesn't work. When anyone with a grain of common sense can say, and I've read, there's another, a meta-analysis of all these studies just proving. And you think about it. You think about the people you know who've got brats. You think about the people you've got who've got badly behaved children who run wild. Do they use biblical discipline? No. Think about the people that you know who, you know, who have lovely, well, I mean, I remember, I remember taking um, one of my sons to, I went to a court case one time, this was years ago now, was it maybe 10 years ago, something like that? It was getting on, no, 8 years ago, something like that, quite a while ago. 7 Changing all the time. It was a number of years ago, and he would have been about, I'm guessing, is it, was he maybe eight or nine in that sort of neck of the woods? I think he was. Was he eight or nine? Yeah. Something like that. Nine? I think so. Okay, about a nine year old. Went to a court case in the Dunedin court and sat there and watched this court case. And some of the people, it was actually a policeman who was on trial, and some people came up to him and talked to me afterwards who were fellow policemen. And they were amazed at how well behaved. This nine-year-old was, sitting in the court, just watching, interested. I wasn't having to, you know, pull him in. Why? Because he's, he's a normal, well-behaved child. Now, is he perfect? No. But it's just normal. It's just normal. Okay? And yet, the number of times where people have said, what, your children are so well-behaved. Is it just luck? Or is it because of following what God says? You know? The Bible says in Proverbs 22, 6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Okay? There is a way that seems right to a man, the Bible says. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. These people, these academics, these parenting experts, they're doing what they think is right. But what's it leading to? It's leading to death. Okay? It's leading to death dysfunction, depression, they're, chained, they're moving the landmarks, they think they know better, they're lifted up in pride, but God's way is best. He says we should correct wayward children, we should teach them to be righteous, we should keep families together, mothers and fathers together, we need to give people hope, and obviously the greatest hope is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we should avoid these mind-altering drugs, you know? and that's a, whole, that's a whole other topic. I mean, look in, honestly, look into it. Look into the, this whole people who've been given drugs. And then, long, I, mean, I, was, I saw this thing about this guy, he was a grandfather. And he'd, you know, at various times in his life, he'd had, you know, ups and downs and stuff. And they prescribed him an antidepressant. And they gave it to him within a week. He'd shot himself and his family. He'd killed them all. Just out of the blue. He'd never done it. He wasn't a violent person. He'd never done anything like that before. And you'll read story after story of people who've taken these, these you know, mind-altering drugs and guess what they've done? 
It's altered their minds. Mm-hmm. And many of them have killed themselves. And it says on the things, it says side, possible side effects are suicidal thoughts. And you can suicidal thoughts can also be homicidal thoughts. Okay? God's way is much better than our way. So not a politi- politically correct sermon, but it's the truth. Okay? And, and Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is truth. Help each one of us to love the truth, to believe the truth, and to follow the truth. Lord, it saddens me to think of these, these young people who are put in this situation not through any fault of their own. Lord, I just pray for sanity to prevail. I pray for people to turn back to you, turn back to your word, to follow your ways, and to seek you, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that makes us free. We praise you and love you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.